Right. So, in this part of the video, we are going to be talking about something known as immunity. I mean, that's what the chapter is all about anyway, right? In the previous videos on this particular chapter, we have looked at the different types of white blood cells and how those white blood cells function, like the B lymphocytes, T lymphocytes, phagocytes, and such. Now, immunity is a rather difficult thing to define because if you ask many people what the word immunity means, um, you will get many different definitions. But what to keep things very simple, this is how we would try to describe immunity. Um, at least in the context of infectious diseases, by the way, not immunity in, I don't know, a reality TV show. So um, immunity just means the ability to fight off an infection from a pathogen, which means that, for example, if let's say a pathogen infects your body and you fall sick, so sometimes uh, because you do not have memory cells against that pathogen, your body does not respond immediately. So the pathogen uh, causes damage in your body and, you know, you get symptoms. Like, for example, if you get COVID, if you get COVID, you will, when you fall sick, you'll have fever, you'll have coughing, the sore throat and such. But after a few days, even if you had COVID, what might happen is you will recover. That is what is meant by the ability to fight off an infection because even though you fell sick, your immune system was able to eventually respond and fight off the pathogens. So, or another way to also define immunity is the ability to resist an infection from a pathogen. For example, if the pathogen entered your body the first time, you did not fall sick at all. The reason is because why? Well, perhaps you had some memory cells that were able to respond to the pathogen quite quickly. So um, these are the two ways we try to define immunity, whether you are able to fight off the infection or whether you are able to resist an infection. Both definitions are fine. How do we obtain this kind of immunity? How do we get this ability to fight off infections uh, or resist an infection? Is there are two ways to there are two methods to obtaining this immunity. The first one is active immunity, and the second one is passive immunity. Now, a lot of times students get very confused with this too. So let's try to define it. When you see the word active immunity, it means that. Okay, let's highlight the word immunity. I told you that immunity means to fight off the infection and resist the infection. But when you see the word active, active means your body has to do the work, which means to say to fight off the infection from the pathogen or to resist the infection, your body or your immune system has to work for it. That means you have to expend energy and resources to try to uh, you know, solve the problem to kill the pathogens that enter your body. Now, some students might go, well, duh, when the pathogens go into my body, my body has to do the work, right? Well, here's the thing. There is also another type of immunity called passive immunity, where immunity just means the same thing, but passive means your body does not have to do the work, which means to say, if a pathogen enters your body, um, your immune system did not actually have to function but the pathogen has been eradicated or they have been uh, destroyed. Now, how is that even possible? That is what we have to see in this particular video. Now, before I explain active or passive immunity in detail, I like to ask my students the question, uh, which immunity is better? Immediately, uh, a lot of my students will say, well, passive immunity sounds better because um, you are able to fight the infection, but your body does not have to do the work. So it seems easier. However, this is where uh, the, the answer to that question is, it depends on the circumstances or it depends on the situation. All right. So let's look at the first type of immunity, which is known as active immunity. And I told you that in active immunity, our body has to do the work to fight off the infection or to resist the infection. For example, active immunity can actually happen naturally. And notice the word that I've highlighted, naturally. 
what does that mean? So let's say a pathogen infected me and I fell sick. Okay, and during the moment I fell sick, I started showing symptoms like, you know, if it's cholera, then, um, you know, diarrhea would happen. Oh, God, I just hope I never get cholera ever. All right. Anyway, so <laughs> let's say uh, so let's say the pathogen enters the body and then it starts causing infection and such. Eventually, after a few days, a process known as clonal selection of B lymphocytes will happen uh, where the specific B lymphocyte with specific receptors complementary to the antigen will be stimulated. The B lymphocytes will undergo clonal expansion. This was all explained in a previous video. And when the B lymphocyte undergoes clonal expansion, it produces plasma cells and it produces memory B lymphocytes. And remember, plasma cells are the ones that release antibodies complementary to the antigens. And I told you that once your body releases the antibodies, the antibodies will bind to the are antigens of the pathogen and a few days later you start to feel better you recover so you did not resist the infection because you fell sick but you were able to fight off the infection even though you fell sick so you recovered and you were alive at the end of it so that's a good thing uh, in this case, this is called active immunity because your body had to work. It was your B lymphocyte that had to do the clonal selection and the clonal expansion. It was your plasma cells that had to produce and release its own antibodies. You had to expend a lot of energy for this to happen. Okay, So if the pathogen infects me again in the future, let's say two months later, will I fall sick? Chances are probably no. The reason is because we have memory B lymphocytes. And what's the function of memory B lymphocytes? Please do not say they remember the infection. That is the wrong way of putting it. You have to say in the exam that the memory B lymphocytes respond faster towards the pathogen. And when it responds faster, you produce much more plasma cells and much more memory B lymphocytes, and you will release more antibodies. So, uh, the pathogen doesn't have much of a chance to infect your body. So you're protected from the pathogen lifelong because memory B cells remain in your body for a long period of time. In some cases, they remain in your body until the day you die. So that's good. In this case over here, this is referred to as active immunity, but it's called natural active immunity because the pathogen infected your body naturally causing an immune response. Immune response meaning to say the clonal selection and the clonal expansion to produce the plasma cells and memory B lymphocytes. So these processes that happen naturally, why do we say it happens naturally? It's because pathogens are all around us. Every time a pathogen just enters your body, for the most part, your body will undergo an immune response. So we would say that this immunity happens naturally. You don't have much of a control over it, okay? Um, because if the pathogen goes into your body, there is a very high chance that you might fall sick, from the first time at least. So this is referred to as natural active immunity. And, and the good thing about natural active immunity is when the pathogen infects you the first time, yes, you fell sick, but it gave your body time to respond to the infection. But the second time, due to memory cells, you will not be able to fall sick anymore because you're protected against it. However, we have a bit of problem. The problem over here is some pathogens, when they infect us for the first time, it may cause permanent damage or death. For example, the polio virus, you don't need to memorize this, but the polio virus, if it infects a child for the first time, the child may recover from the infection, yes, but the child may develop leg paralysis where, you know, the leg, uh, the nerves in the legs are damaged so they may walk with a limp or they may not be able to walk properly for the rest of their lives. So even though they managed to recover from the infection, there were permanent effects that will affect the quality of the life of the child. Or in some cases, the measles virus. When it infects the child the first time, uh, it may cause a few symptoms and the child might recover. That is good, but it is also one of the main causes of childhood blindness. And this blindness is permanent because the measles virus can also damage the cells in our eyes. So 
even though they recovered, they did not walk away from the infection unscathed. They actually had some permanent side effects. So uh, just to draw it again, the measles pathogen, it infects the child or the person. The person falls sick and shows symptoms. Yes, they may recover, but they may have permanent side effects. They may have some lung scarring. They may have uh, blindness. So the question here is, how do we build immunity towards the pathogen without falling sick? In this case, we have to do a process known as artificial active immunity. So what does it mean by artificial active immunity? It means that we try to infect the person without making them fall sick. And you might be thinking, wait, how do we do that? Is that even possible? It is quite possible because in this case, look at the pathogen. The pathogen has, what, what, are, the thing, what are those things that I've highlighted on the surface of the pathogen? Those are antigens, right? And in this case, Artificial active immunity is just inserting the vaccine into a person. So what exactly is a vaccine? A lot of times students will say, oh, vaccine is a medication. Uh, it's a supplement to make your immune system function better. I want you to understand that vaccines are not medicines, okay? They're not given to people who are sick, all right? A vaccine itself, by definition, is just basically a particular solution or preparation that contains dead or weakened pathogens, or sometimes it contains just the antigens only. So pathogens are active. If the pathogens are active, they can go into your body and cause infections, right? But what scientists do is we will take the pathogen, which is active over here, and we would deliberately kill it, okay? and we will insert the dead pathogen into the person's body. So when the dead pathogen is inserted into the person's body, purposefully, by the way, will the person fall sick? Chances of the person falling sick is very low, all right? Because, or almost non-existent, because the pathogen cannot cause an infection. Or what we do is we just slice off the pathogen and just inject or insert the antigens. It's just the antigens that we are concerned with. Okay, because that's the antigens are the foreign substances that cause the immune response. So when vaccines are given to the person, vaccines can be inserted in a multitude of ways. It can be inserted through droplets orally, or it can also be injected. But let's just talk about injections. So the vaccines are inserted into the body. Why? So you might be thinking, wait, these vaccines are harmless because, you know, they are dead pathogens or antigens, but they are still foreign. I told you earlier that because they are foreign, they will still cause an immune response where the antigens or the dead pathogens will meet with the specific B lymphocyte and it will undergo, the B lymphocyte will undergo clonal selection. The B lymphocyte doesn't care whether the pathogen is dead or whether the antigens are just floating around. All the B lymphocytes are concerned with is whether something is foreign or not foreign in the body, right? So as long as your B lymphocytes see antigens, they're like, oh, 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 God, this is an emergency, okay? We have to respond to it. Even though the pathogens or the antigens are not causing an infection, your B lymphocytes will still respond. That is how hypervigilant your immune system is supposed to be. So in this case, the B lymphocytes will still undergo clonal expansion and it produces memory B lymphocytes and plasma cells, all right? And this is good because when it produces our memory B lymphocytes, why is that good? After vaccination, the person has the memory B lymphocytes in the body. Now, let's say one day the person's walking around and the active pathogen, that means this pathogen is alive, okay, and may cause an infection. It tried to infect the person. It, it entered the person's body. Will it be able to cause an infection? The answer is no, it will not be able to cause an infection because the person has memory B lymphocytes to respond to the pathogen's quickly. So the person does not fall sick. In this case, the person was able to resist the infection the first time immediately. So that's good. And this is referred to as something called as artificial active immunity. The word artificial means it was produced by human beings rather than happening naturally. All right. 
to just summarize active immunity a little bit, the first one from the active immunity is natural active immunity, where the pathogen infects us, we fell sick, and our B cells undergo clonal selection and clonal expansion. The B cells will then form the plasma cells and memory cells. And of course, the plasma cells will release the antibodies. And when it releases the antibodies, we recover. If the pathogen were to infect us in the future, let's say a few months later or even a few years later, the same pathogen will be accosted <laughs> by our memory B lymphocytes, which responds much faster. So in this case, we were able to resist the infection and not fall sick. So that's good. But in artificial active immunity, we put the dead pathogen or antigens into a person's body deliberately through a process known as vaccination because dead pathogens or antigens are just referred to as vaccines, right? So a vaccine, when it's inserted into the body, our body will still respond. We, we, we won't fall sick because the pathogens cannot cause an infection. They are dead or they are inactive, but our body will still respond to it. Clonal selection and clonal expansion will still happen. Plasma cells and memory cells are still produced and your body will still release antibodies the first time. But the more important thing is, the second, uh, the more important thing is, the reason we did this is because we wanted the memory B lymphocytes. So that if the pathogen tries to infect you in the future, you already have memory B cells to protect you, basically. So the point is, whether it's natural active immunity or artificial active immunity, clonal selection and expansion will happen because antigens are entering your body, by the way. Okay, So our immune cells undergoes the immune response. Number two, your body had to do the immune response, so you had to release the antibodies yourself. Remember, active meaning to say you have to do the work. Who is producing the antibodies here? You are producing the antibodies. Okay, number three, because of immune response, you produced memory cells, which is good. And number four, because of memory cells, future response to the same pathogen is much faster. So in this case, this is referred to as something called long-term protection. And the graph for active immunity looks exactly the same as what we did in the previous video. In natural active immunity, when you had the first infection, you fell sick and your plasma cells produce some antibodies. That is true. But in the future, if the pathogen infects your body in the future, your body will respond much faster due to memory cells. What about vaccination? If you infect, if you vaccinated the person, you just inserted the antigens, will the person fall sick? Chances are the person will not fall sick. But look, it takes a few days and the plasma cells still produce some antibodies because you did undergo an immune response. And in the future, if the same pathogen tries to infect you, the response towards the pathogen will be much faster as well because of the memory cells.